are listening to Neurosalience, the OHBM podcast. Welcome to the Organization for Human Brain Mapping Neurosalience podcast. I'm your host, Peter Banatini. In this podcast, I interview brain scientists and discuss their work as well as the latest advancements and challenges in the field of brain mapping. Today's discussion is defined by the guest as well as the topic. Dick Passingham is a well-known and well-respected neuroscientist who could talk at length about literally hundreds of topics in neuroscience. Today, we're discussing the general question of how neuroimaging, and mostly fMRI, fit into the landscape of neuroscience research approaches. More specifically, we discuss the question of what, over the years, has neuroimaging taught us about the brain. In this fascinating discussion, we work through many related topics and get a solid sense of Dr. Passingham's perspectives on these, including his views on mentoring, a critique or rather a refinement of David Marr's three criteria for understanding the brain, the need to put forth falsifiable hypotheses, but also the value of discovery science. We also just talk about his enthusiasm for optically pumped magnetometers, and also the need for an array of tools and approaches, not just fMRI for understanding the brain. Passacam is currently Emeritus Professor of Cognitive Neuroscience at the Department of Experimental Psychology at the University of Oxford, and is also Emeritus Fellow at Wadham College in Oxford. In addition, he is Emeritus Honorary Principal Investigator at the Wellcome Center for Human Neuroimaging at University College London. His career has been spent at these two institutions and from 1991 to 1995, also at the MRC Cyclotron Unit at the Hammersmith Hospital in London. He has published over 200 research papers and eight books. And lastly, he was elected a fellow of the Royal Society in 2009 in recognition of his achievements. I hope you enjoy our conversation. Okay, uh, welcome, uh, Dick, uh, to the Dick Passingham to the uh, uh, Neurosalience podcast. It's it's quite an honor to have you here. I believe most of the field knows of your your work and your and your legacy. And this actually this interview started the idea for it just on Twitter, and which you're. You still uh, contribute quite a bit to that, and and with your thoughts on imaging, has told us that other techniques have not. So, so uh, just to begin, you know, we'll talk about that. We'll talk about how it's complementary. We'll talk about, uh, you know, how it might be used in the future, uh, potentially some of its limits, some of its advantages. But just to start, um, why don't you uh, just talk a little bit about, uh, you know, your history and you know, sort of highlight your career and. And all the all the students you've had and whatever since about 1966 till about 2004 i worked mainly with macaques but in 1980 or so i heard richard fakoviak give a talk and i went up to him and said oh that's interesting uh, i'd like to collaborate on pet and that was at the mrc cyclotron unit so I uh, ran a group on macaques in Oxford and on PET in London. Then uh, we moved uh, to the hill, as it's become called, um, in uh, 1996 to do fMRI. And um, at the same time, I was the first person to use RTMS in Oxford. In America in particular, and Canada, people were worried that it could only be done under medical supervision. And we worked first of all with doctors, but then it seemed to us that it was safe. And so we used it for many years without medical supervision, and that's become the norm in this country. I work on the motor system in general, that is 
prefrontal, premotor, supplementary motor, motor, cerebellum, basal ganglia, and have done work on all those areas, though I'm probably best known for books on prefrontal, but I wrote a book called The Frontal Lobes and Voluntary Action, and that was actually on the whole of the frontal lobes. So much of it was on premotor and motor and supplementary motor. So I'm really interested in the system as a whole. And I don't think anybody should think that what they're trying to work out is what one area does. What they're trying to work out is what a system does. So in that sense, right. I mean, I think that, right, when you when you see, say, premotor and motor, it's like actions, decision making. You, know, you can have the whole entire system engaged, you know, working memory, whatever. And actually, it, it ties into, which we might talk a little bit about later, is this sort of, you know, conscious awareness and, and sort of, you know, how one decides and, and you know, in a changing environment. So, and you work, mostly work with macaques. And, and and the techniques that you mostly use with macaques were, were mostly, uh, you know, in place electrodes or? Yes, I was mainly using lesion techniques at surgery using binocular dissection microscope. But then we also use canic acid to avoid um, damaging the fibers of passage. I didn't use Massimol, but obviously most neurophysiologists now not only record from single units, but also use Massimol, their complementary techniques. So you, you, you mentioned to me uh, when we were talking earlier, uh, all your students, I mean, it seems like you have, a, you have quite a, a team of people that have come through your lab. And I don't know if you wanted to mention that briefly, just to just to give people a perspective of, of how many of the different people that you've trained. I've not had a huge group, uh, unlike you, who have a group of about 50. <laughs> well, the people that you did have are, are extremely prominent in the field. That's <laughs> the philosophy. I never thought that I could run a group unless I could look at the data every week. And I thought if I had a group of more than eight, I could never look at the data every week. And what as a scientist you live on is the data. Yes. But there may be things you weren't expecting and there may be things you were expecting. And that's the fun. So the group in London, I used to go down one day a week, but I spent the whole day looking at nothing but data, looking for artifacts and so on. Uh, so, uh, yes, I, I've had some people who've done very well. I think it's partly a philosophy that was old fashioned. When I did my PhD, uh, my supervisor worked on parietal cortex and I said I wanted to work on prefrontal. So we said, fine, and we devised one experiment together, which um, was interested him. And from then on, he left me to do what I wanted. Then I came back to Oxford, and for five years, I was on a grant to Larry Weisskrantz and Alan Cowie, and it was on vision. And I said I wanted to work on prefrontal. And they said, fine, and I worked on prefrontal, and they never put their name on a single one of those papers, nor did my PhD supervisor put his name on the papers of things that I devised. That's interesting. Uh... <laughs> that was a, a tradition which has got lost because the uh, grant giving bodies demand deliverables what you're going to find out next week and the week after and what i found was i would write a grant in the summer for five years by the time i started the grant it was clear that the ideas were stupid and uh, so i would do something else and then during the grant would find things and we'd follow them up and I, of course, at the end of the grant, I had to write back to the Wellcome Trust to tell them what I'd done. Never once did they say there's a total mismatch between what you said you were going to do and what you did. Never once. Yes. 
<laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> oh, <man. laughs> um, now, of the people who work with me, therefore, I, I followed up this idea. So I let people do what they wanted. And at the film, when we took people on, what happened is people came and they were interviewed by several people and they were asked, what do you want to do? That's what they did. Of the people working with me, Hakuan Lao worked on consciousness. He had a philosophy background. Matthew Rushworth worked on singulate. And indeed, when he stopped being a postdoc with me, we agreed with each other uh, we sort of divided things up and I said look I won't work on the singulate that was his patch it came out of experiments that that happened when he was working with me but nonetheless it was his patch Narendra Ramnani worked on uh, the cerebellum still does Ivan uh, Tony's worked on many things including uh, the motor system but also theory of mind uh, John Agleton works on the amygdala Henrik Harrison works on the out-of-body experiences and so on. Yeah. In other words, they're very varied and that's what I'm pleased with because I think if all you're doing is teaching people to be a carbon copy of yourself, you fail. Yeah. Yeah. I like, I like how you have this wide diversity and it's just basically in the idea of, you know, you're, you have these you have these tools and you, and you just want to understand, you know, the, the, the processes in the brain that, that can lend themselves to these to some extent, or, you know, you use more tools or, or you decide. And, and I like the idea. Um, and I do this as well in my own group is, is sort of, you know, get a feel for what they want and, and then, you know, figure out something that, that works as far as that's concerned. I'm really, I'm really uh, also impressed with the idea that, that you sort of, you, know, you say, oh, look, you know, you can do this. I'll, I'll continue working on this part. So there's no, there's no competition. Sometimes that's implicit and sometimes it's actually doesn't happen. And I, well, and I thought it's very civilized that, uh, yeah, that's wonderful that you do that. Yeah. Without citing names, I know somebody very well known uh, who uh, had a student who is very well known indeed and they fell out because exactly the original supervisor jealous of the fact that the person went on working on the same subject yeah, yeah. i actually i've often found though that that the field is so broad it's almost even even trying to say look you work on this and i work on this is is hard uh, just because, I mean, it seems like there's, it's never a zero sum game. It's sort of, you know, everyone is, it eventually works to be complimentary, but. Uh, yeah. um, I, I've never found any difficulty in working out what over my life working with these people is a common theme. I can find that theme. And so I'm not worried. I, I benefited and, and I think they have. Because I think the job of the PI is to look after the career of the people working with them. They're not slaves. Yeah, I totally agree. I totally agree. It's, you know, and some PIs don't realize that, that, that our job is to sort of... Start disagreeing over something. <laughs> okay, so let's get into, um, let's get into what, what this podcast is about and, and uh, what imaging has taught us that was unique about the brain. And, and maybe we'll just jump into it. Um, and in terms of even in terms of understanding the brain and the general approach, I mean, you, I've, you know, I've read a num just reading a number of, you know, review articles. Everyone seems to like uh, David Mars, you know, breaking down. What does it mean to understand the brain? You know, you look at the functional properties uh, of the process as it's uh, uh, as it's defined and behaviorally characterized. You, and then you look at the computational algorithm uh, that perform the process. And then, and then you look at, you know, how the neurons actually do it, uh, the nuts and bolts. You, you sort of re... I don't like this at all. Yes. So why is that? So let me, I'm kind of curious about what your construct of that would be. The top level is function. That's defined in psychological terms and the brain doesn't work in psychological terms. 
you want to explain explain that just really quickly? Who is like the brain doesn't work in working memory or something right. like that. Just Next, um, two is the algorithm. Now, what David had in mind was that this could be something a computer could do. I'm not interested in what a computer could do. I'm not a computer man. I'm interested in what the brain does. For me, there are only two questions. I don't want to talk about function because that's not how the brain works. I want to think in the following way. We showed in a paper in 2002 that each brain area that we looked at had a unique pattern of inputs and outputs. And we suggested that that was the basis of functional localization. Now, what follows from that? Well, the next obvious question, if an area A has a unique pattern of inputs and outputs, is what transformation is performed from that set of inputs to that set of outputs. Now I accept that that transformation may be dynamic, there may no, be no single transformation, it may be context dependent and so on. To simplify, let me just say what transformation. So there is some change that occurs from those inputs. So take the frontal eye field. Parietal puts in visual inputs. And those, as measured by Charles in the frontal eye field, are V cells. And they're found in the upper layers, they're visual cells. But then he also finds visual motor cells and he finds motor cells. So there's a transformation from a visual input, which might be an array of targets of which the animal has to choose one, to an eye movement or a direction of attention towards one of those targets. That's what the front life fields is fundamentally doing. Heinzler and Martin produced a, a theory about how the cells within that area might perform that transformation, given what we know about the cell properties. It's one of the best worked out since David Marr that I know of. And in particular, they compared the columnar structure within the eye fields with that in V1. Now, Pat Goldman, as she then was, had done that too. But it's not the same. So there is something about the cells in that area and the way they're connected and organized that enables that particular transformation. The one is what transformation is performed, namely from a visual input to a, a saccade or attentional movement. And two, how is it performed? And that's to do with the cells within the area, the actual cells. Yes. Now, I know that fMRI people produce all their lovely computational theories and all the rest. They're miles away from this. But I believe we are after are the sorts of theories that David Marr produced on the cerebellum, the archicortex or hippocampus, and the neocortex. Those were theories that looked at Kahal, said what cells there were, how they were connected, and then, using the maths that he knew, tried to work out how the areas did what we believed they did. So, so let me just make one question though. So, so with Mar, uh, you know, I still think there's it maybe it might be semantic at least in my view. Like the computation versus transformation is sort of I, I kind of think of them as the same thing, but I might be naive as far as that's concerned. But, but, but it's interesting. Yeah, I don't disagree that it's computation. I just want to think of it rather in terms of what goes in and what comes out. The difference is the computation that's performed within. 
Yeah. And it's, it's interesting the way you break it down. I, I like, uh, yeah, I mean, essentially you have, you know, different properties, you have coding of, of maybe by rate or by phase and, or by, and then you have excitation inhibition of neighboring cells and setting up these maybe attractor states or whatever, but and it's, I, I like the idea of sort of each area has maybe these fundamental, you know, first principle sort of properties and it might just be as simple as as various combinations and collections of those, you know, that are that are doing this. The simplest idea would be that actually all the difference between the areas is the inputs and outputs, and that the cells within can do whatever. Now, I don't believe that that's actually true, but it may be nearer the truth than my, one might like to believe. Yeah. And that, that brings me to the question. Okay. So let's just kind of jump into fMRI here. So, you know, obviously fMRI looks, you know, makes maps. I mean, you can, it's, it's great in the sense that you can actually look at different areas and how they're connected. And so that informs at some spatial scale, how the areas are communicating. But I always felt with fMRI, I mean, I'm obviously a big promoter of fMRI, but I always felt that, are we looking at the right scale? Are we looking at, uh, you know, obviously there's, the neuronal level scale and there's connectivity and it seems like there's it, it spans scales and and if you're really trying to understand what the transformation is uh it seems that you have to either pick the right scale or maybe understand it across scales uh in that regard i think the spatial resolution of fmri is absolutely fine for the purpose for which it's used that is if you look at tanaka uh, and and also Wang, who used optical imaging in infratemporal cortex, there are patches of about 0.3 to 0.4 millimeters coding for different shapes. They overlap and so on. And, th and that's the basis of sort of Jim Haxby and Connolly's ability to to classify what we're seeing. But we, we knew that from for monkeys. Now, but it's of that order. And if you look in prefrontal, Constantinides with Pat Goldman Rakic recorded from cells in pre dorsal, mid dorsal prefrontal, and the cell activity of a cell correlates with cells roughly 0.3 millimeters, sorry, roughly, yeah, 0.3 millimeters apart. The sorts of scales we're talking about that in which things are coded is not very far away from the sorts of scales which fMRI is approaching. So I'm not unhappy about the spatial resolution really at all. However, what fMRI tells you, it's a functional new anatomical technique. It tells you where things are. And though I, uh, uh, in our lab, we tried and other people have tried to use it for physiological studies and we had some success. Um, nonetheless, it's fundamentally an anatomical technique, a functional anatomical technique. So it tells you simply where things are. Although, but although I would argue, though, also that it's... Oh. Our is how does it work? No, it's like saying, oh, I'll first of all tell you, this is a car engine, and by the way, this is the gasket, and, and this is uh, the carburetor. Well, okay, so now we've named the pieces. Well, how do they work? Well, I think, I mean, fMRI gives you a little bit more in terms of, you know, for instance, looking at adaptation, or habituation, you know, you can modulate the magnitude to some degree, and that might give you, you know, relative activity with specific, I mean, but I agree with you though, ultimately it's a spatial. Technique um, is probably overused. Um, if you try it with single units, you often have to repeat it several times before you'll get the adaptation. But obviously it's one thing, we did a study, Eva Antoni and I, Oh, we were proud of it. We, we, it was one of the early event-related studies. We, we thought of our own event-related method. Um, we were looking at premotor, and we worked out if you 
uh, adjusted the data to the stimulus or if you adjusted the data to the response what did you see and what we found was that in premotor you can see a stimulus an effect of the stimulus then a delay effect and then effect of the response so that's doing a very basic physiology but Steve Wise had done that with single units years ago. <laughs> so what do you think? So so going right to, so along those lines, so you had a paper out in 2012 sort of saying, you know, fMRI or and neuroimaging hasn't really taught us anything new, but then it seems like you've changed your mind a little bit. So what, what are the things, and maybe we've already talked about this to some degree, but how has, what, what unique that fMRI has contributed that the others, that the other techniques have not? Let me start by saying how my thoughts have actually changed. Um, in 2012, I wrote a book with Steve Wise on the neurobiology of prefrontal cortex. And there was only one chapter on the human brain. And the reason was that we found nothing in the human literature that changed the way we thought about prefrontal cortex on the basis of macaque data. It really didn't. All these proud studies Uncle Cortex, and there are thousands of them. But the question is, have they really shown us new principles? And, and in my mind at that time, they had not. I then wrote a paper together with Kat Sakai and James Rowe, saying that the only thing I thought that um, imaging had shown that was new was context-specific connectivity, which Macintosh using structural equation modeling and Carl Friston using um, psychophysiological interactions and then DCM introduced and, and Kat Saka and I did a study in which we showed that prefrontal interacted with different areas depending what task you were going to do. So it did so before you did the task. It was actually setting up the task. That, however, was based on a covariance matrix, just as are all the other methods. So it's not proof. And no scientist should be depending on a single method to say something. So what Katsakai then did when he went back to Japan was use EEG. He stimulated the frontal eye field and he showed that if you were going to do a motion task, stimulating a single pulse to the eye field of enhanced activity in MT before you saw the motion, and it enhanced the activity in IT, in infratemporal cortex, if it was a shape task. Okay. And I went on to do that in 2013 using fMRI with John Driver. So they showed that TMSing single pulse, FEF, enhanced the fusiform face area if you were going to do a gender task of a face, whereas it enhanced MT, but not the FFA, if you were going to do the motion, the face being made up of moving pixels. You need, to, you need I, I feel this incredibly strongly, that people are losing the idea that the way science works is not to simply use a single method. You follow it up with other methods that prove the causal link. Granger causality, I mean, Juan Desimone did a study in which they showed the frontal eye field enhances before infratemporal cortex when a monkey is looking for a target. That's simply Granger causality, a further study to prove that it's actually a causal effect. I totally agree with that. And I think that um, as far as fMRI is concerned, certainly the, you know, the variability of the hemodynamic response, the plumbing, but you can't do temporal, you know, unless you're modulating it. Uh, a, a well-known task looking in one area and then looking at the modulation. But I totally agree. Looking at 
EEG, MEG, uh, or even knocking it out with, uh, you know, specifying with uh, TMS or things like that to modulate that as well to look at causality. I totally, totally agree. And actually, you mentioned OPM. And and I think for the audience, uh, I think it's relatively new technology. What's the advantage of OPM over like MEG in that regard? These are optically pumped magnetometers. So it's MEG, but they're located on a helmet. And in the latest versions that I've seen devised in Nottingham in this country, and I'm sure there are similar ones in the States, there are a whole array of these OPMs in the helmet, which is like a bike helmet, and you can actually walk around with them because if you make sure that the cables, you, you, you correct for any movement of the cables and so on, yes. you can get people actually walking around a room. You can do it with infants. That's... You put the helmet on them. Yeah. You get much bigger signals than MEG. You can get a really good hippocampal signal. You can do it in one of two ways. You can either put one of them in your mouth. Okay. Very well. Or you can have it here, and that also does it very well. So, actually, the data that I've seen coming out of OPMs, which obviously I'm seeing coming out of uh, the Phil in London, is very impressive indeed. For example, if you remember, retrieve, an episodic memory from the past, the ventral prefrontal cortex precedes the hippocampus in that retrieval. Yes. And if you imagine an event in the distant future, the same is true. That was all done with OPMs. And it's just not sensitive enough, I guess, with MEG or too cumbersome as, that, as, as far as that's concerned. Is much bigger with OPMs. That's nice. I mean, that's actually I've I've been hearing about OPMs for the last maybe five years, but I, I haven't seen them. I haven't actually seen one in practice. So uh, that's exciting. And I do think I mean, you still even though you're closer, you still might have to some degree the the whole inverse problem, but it's less of an issue, I guess, uh, to some degree. That's great. That's great. So um, so back to but just just to get back to as far as fMRI is concerned, so or neuroimaging uh, in general, talking about uh, you know obviously it it gives you aware and it, in that sense it's sort of it's like I mean aware doesn't really inform I mean obviously it helps you then do more focused studies and to some degree it might give you a little bit of magnitude and and maybe you can look at long time scales as things change uh, with patients or whatever. Uh, and certainly there's a share of insights that come from that. One issue that I've always had with fMRI though, is this, this measure of, so the idea of connectivity. I mean, I think it's a great, I believe that it's mostly true, but I think that it's still hard to interpret connectivity. Connectivity for me is what you demonstrate with either traces in macaques or other animals or viruses, if you're looking at polysynaptic connections. Okay. That's what I mean by connection. Okay. Okay. And and actually, you you mentioned um, you know, right. So polysynaptic connections. So what would be as far as understanding functional processes? I mean, I think that uh, people may not understand the significance of differentiating monosynaptic versus polysynaptic. It seems that is it does it really matter? I mean, uh, does it is it somehow critical that it, that you know that areas have to be monosynaptically connected to be functionally you know, or, yeah. Think of the famous Van Essen map of the visual system. That's monosynaptic. And Young did the same thing. That's what, that's the connections of the brain. Now, of course, you can get from anywhere to anywhere. But nonetheless, the basic connections are those connections. That's the brain. Now, let me just say something about uh, the advantages of um, imaging clearly one thing is that um, it's home brain and that's what allowed you to find context dependent connectivity because where would a physiologist know where to record to find the three areas the next thing is that 
when we were using PET, um, it was possible because we had a baseline, we had an arterial line, and though we could get a measure of activity at rest, so it wasn't just an average of everything, look at depression. And in 1984, Harry Jenkins and I found that when you did motor learning, there were areas that, that depressed. And Marcus Drakel found that when you did verb generation, the same happened. Now, we weren't expecting this. And there's an enormous suspicion in imaging about looking at unexpected findings. Yes. And the reason is everybody's terrified that you're p-hacking. Answer to that. You simply go and you re replicate the study yourself. Right. So, Rachel has done lots of studies on depression of the medial surface, in particular when you're doing externally given tasks. And Narendra Ramnani and I did a study on rhythm learning in which we showed that while you were learning auditory rhythms, which you were tapping with your finger, there was a steady decrease in activity in the infratemporal cortex across time. It's irrelevant. The infratemporal cortex isn't interested in pet game uh, to do that. So that's another thing that um, I think imaging has found you wouldn't know where the depressions would be unless it was whole brain. Third, it's found that um, when people do particular tasks like drive London taxis or juggle, there are changes in either grey matter or myelin or a mixture of both. And you asked me before we start whether this had been uh, followed up and the answer is, of course it has. Yes, yeah, I just was looking for the literature. I haven't seen that much. Let me tell you why it matters. First of all, of course, the, ma the taxi drivers was a, a retrospective study. So they then did it prospectively and it still worked. Juggling, that's prospective, that's fine. They then got rats reaching and they had a specific measure of myelin. And there was an increase of myelin there's a direct correlation between the degree of myelin and the improvement in reaching of a rat's paw. But then, Heidi Johansenberg, and I'm afraid, I don't know if this is published yet, so I don't know if I should be talking about it. I've heard of her work. I, I've heard of that work as well. Tell me, has been looking at mutant mice that do not change their myelin in adulthood. They can reach perfectly well. They can learn to reach perfectly well. So they're not just stupid. But on a running wheel, they simply don't coordinate their limbs. Huh. It looks as if, and this is my interpretation, the exact timing matters and there's now a measure which you'll know more about than i do mri g something in which you can measure using mri the speed of conduction oh okay okay right yeah the, the nerve conduction and i i better not i i won't say the the study i know of that's used this because I, it isn't published and I, 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 I shouldn't talk about it, but I do know of a study that has shown a relation between the speed of conduction and an ability. And I, I'm, I'm being very vague about the ability because I don't want to say what the study was. Yeah, and, and that in its sense, I mean, I'm glad you brought that up because that's sort of like a, a new principle that only MRI can, you know, MRI lends itself to looking at myelin. Um, or at least myelin water uh, within myelin potentially, but also it's actually nice because uh, you know it sort of suggests that there's certainly there's myelinated areas that come intrinsically, but then the myelination can change, you know, because the environment can change, and 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 you might have to adapt skills in some regard, and and that sort of that that myelination increases speed, but also I think it also keeps the structure, um, it keeps the things more stable. So it's less able to change to something else. 
we don't know yet what the effect is and I think we should be using the electron microscope to look at this and to see where the changes are you know um, is it right along the axon or is it near the synaptic junction or where is it we don't know it may be there are, you know it relates to the more packets of uh, transmitter or whatever we don't know until we study it but there is an effect here which we didn't know about look I, i'm glad you brought that up because it sort of does open up you know mri quantitative mri is still sort of beginning i mean you have you know, correlations with cytoarchitecture in other aspects as well, which is just uh, exciting in that regard. The other thing that MRI does is, of course, two other things. One, it it uh, looks at the human brain. So the reason that I've changed my mind is that I've been thinking more about abilities that are peculiar to people. Theory of mind related to theory of yourself, the ability to imitate precisely as is needed if you're to learn either sign language or spoken language, language itself, the ability to use a propositional code as opposed to a visual code, to use Coslin's terms, when reasoning. All these things are things that people do and that can only be studied in people and therefore fMRI is one of the tools but only one of the tools for studying them but also there are human disorders there are auditory hallucinations there's the fact the superior temporal cortex is overactive when you hear voices we don't know if that's a top-down effect or not right uh, there's the fact the ke family um, in London, uh, who uh, uh, is a four generational family, have a single gene which leads to a severe language impairment. And it's imaging that's shown us where in the brain, Broca's area, the putamen, and elsewhere, there are changes. Then there's the fact that if you take depression, well, animals get depressed, but we do, which they don't, is think about the distant future. And we can also think about the distant past, episodic memory and episodic simulation. That makes depression much more long lasting and much deeper because you're brooding. And if you study people while they're brooding, what you find is overactivity in medial areas, in the areas that are active when people think about the past or the or the distant future. Like the default mode network to, to some degree. So. But you can only study in people. And the third, the third thing about imaging is that um, you can study it over time. So you can study children learning language or failing to learn language, learning theory of mind. You can study teenagers and their impulsive ways. You can study old people as they lose their memories and as they get slower in making decisions. You can study them over time. And that's and to the extent that these clinical uh, or, or you know, across time, not only tells you, you know, potentially clinical applications of fMRI, but also just gives you information about the brain, right? And how it evolves, how it changes, how it adapts, uh, that you couldn't, right, with, you, you, theoretically, you could have implanted electrodes or look at individuals over time in various ways, but it's so hard, it, this, the information you get. Well, study, a typical study of macaques, neurophysiology, is a two-year study. Uh, there aren't studies studying macaques over, over the over the lifetime over or whatever and so it's something that imaging lends itself to but do you think that that information so so once again going back to understanding the brain do you think it's certainly it's an aspect of understanding the brain but do you think it's more you know descriptive it's like oh this is kind of stuff that happens or do you think that it might reveal you know once again principles of of brain organization well we know from people like Gallant and Anderson. Anderson got people reading, and Gallant 
people listening to, to us at the radio, uh, we know about the semantic system. We know where it is. We can also show, as Anderson did, that um, if you think of a word, you can also imagine the thing it stands for because you find activity in visual areas. So, there are things that we can say, but I don't think we should depend on a simple study like on, on studies like that. What you need to do is to go on as happened in, um, oh, I forget the name now. Um, uh, you need to stimulate the brain in different areas and show where you can disrupt all these processes. And that's been done all over in different, different patients. Yeah, and I think that's just beginning. I think that's just starting as far as that's concerned. Yeah, you mentioned Gallant. I, I actually was curious what you thought of, of, you know, like, you know, when he makes his maps, he has this wonderful, I think one of my favorite, and I think we agree that one of the favorite paradigms is sort of, you know, pioneered by Eleanor McGuire, uh, the naturalistic stimuli, having people driving, or in the, in the case of Jack Gallant, listening to stories, and creating these amazing semantic maps that seem to defy localization uh, as we understand it. And, and it's, it just seems that memories and relationships are. Okay. I don't think it's localization at all. All you're doing is looking at a map and seeing splodge all over. And so you're saying it's not localized. You're just supposing that all of that is doing the same thing. That's not true at all. Right. Yeah, no. I think what he's saying is that there's there's areas, there's semantic spaces that have relationships that sort of build networks and but it's sort of it seems like it does doesn't necessarily follow. Uh I mean, maybe that maybe I'm I'm wrong in terms of a term. I wouldn't say it's totally homogeneous. I'm saying it's structured, but it's 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 less structured than it's somewhere well, between. There are study by Desposito showing that when you're learning word meanings, prefrontal is involved, but when you have learned them, they're stored infratemporal hippocampus and so on. There are differences between these. So it could be right. There could be a mixing in that regard, but um, not not as I see it anyway. All right, but I mean that's actually one thing that is interesting um, with fMRI is that it does surprise in that regard. It forces us to get more, you know, focused on our experiments and and certainly it opens things up. I mean, the idea is that it's uh, you have this dimension of time with naturalistic stimuli and you can actually, like you said, there's a certain amount of uh, discovery science to this where you you do something and you see where it happens. You don't necessarily have a clear a clear hypothesis as to what should happen. And then it iterates in that regard. Russ Pondrak and people like that would hate you for saying that um, because of the reducibility problem. But that's to, turned to be out true even of cancer biology. Um, and it's true of the genetics of psychiatric disorders. It's all over science, the reproducibility right. problem. So, I'm not saying the reproducibility problem doesn't exist. There's a simple way out of it. Simply reproduce your own studies. Do them yes. again. Yeah. Motor learning uh, in PET once, then again twice, then in fMRI, and and in other words, we, we did we did it several times. You don't just treat a single study. Um, I remember somebody, and I won't say who it is, in the early days, saying, oh, you can't replicate studies, it's too expensive. <laughs> it's all about making sure that your data are sound. Yeah, I totally agree with that. I, I think that, uh, and I think, I, I do think Russ and I would agree on, on um, uh, right, all the, I think that for reproducibility, the idea of having open, open methods, open data, shared data, even big data where, where everything is transparent, uh, standard methods as well to some degree. But still, I mean, yeah, it's still nice to see that fMRI discovers things that you wouldn't expect necessarily as far as it's concerned. Horrible standard methods. The um, people 
think that the thing to do is to put all their data into some a thing like Peter Foxy right database. And I think it's just rotten. It is honestly, it is so coarse in the way in which it defines things. It talks about attention and this and that. We simply cannot think about the brain like that. I, I'm not I, against databases. I'm not against meta-analyses. Meta-analyses can be very powerful, but um, I really don't believe, in spite of various attempts to produce databases, that that's the way we should be going. Yeah, I, 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 I do. You know, I do see your point. I mean, the idea with the idea, not the databases, but the labels we use necessarily. I would love to have the database tell us what what the neural correlates of. I mean, to say, look, you know, attention isn't the right way to chop this up. You, you there's some other dimension uh, in which the brain is doing something that's related. The way you put the data into the database, it doesn't allow you um, to to. It doesn't allow different studies which are very different in their details yeah yeah i see yeah i see your point i mean there's and there's different types of databases there's the broad ones like peter fox's uh neurosynth whatever and then there's the there's the consortium databases that have things very controlled in some regard um that might well, be a little bit more is fine because it's transparent, it's open, everybody can use it. And um, uh, David Van Essen keeps a very sharp eye over it. <laughs> right, right, right. And the Connectome database has been incredibly useful for method development. I mean, just simply all kinds of things. So, yeah. yeah. And it's, 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 it's an astonishing achievement. Yeah. Even if only 1,200 people, you know. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right, right. I don't think, however, that the work that's been done using it to look at individual differences has proved at all useful. And that's actually another area uh, that I think fMRI, I and mean, that's sort of going more into clinical, but but not necessarily. I mean, I think that you know everyone's similar in some ways and different in some ways, and and, and to understand that a little bit more using neuroimaging, I think is useful, and and using using these maybe naturalistic stimuli or ways of doing detailed comparisons between individuals in many dimensions could reveal a lot of interesting things um, as far as that's concerned uh, about the brain, about how it creates differences in personality, in you know, behavior and other sort of ways. So what do you see? I mean, it's pretty clear that you're, you see the future sort of being more of a multimodal. I mean, people, you and you emphasize rightly that, that people should be neuroscientists, not tied to a method. Um, do you, so where do you see the future going? It's like, for instance, there's layer fMRI coming about. And I, and I, from our previous discussions, you said that, well, you have to get maybe a little bit better resolution to really use that. Um, I'm kind of curious your thoughts on that. Uh, and what advice, you know, the future of imaging and the advice you have for researchers, as far as that's concerned. Well, the first thing is, it's very stupid for any scientist to predict the future because we're always wrong. <laughs> so, so, yep. Yeah. I don't have to answer that question. I have to say that if I was starting again, I would not use fMRI. I will be using uh, uh, MEG and LPMs because the questions that it seems to me we're trying to answer, if they're about the human brain, are questions of mechanism, of how it does, not where it does it. So MEG, um, you, you might have to do an fMRI study in parallel to, to make sure that your localizations were accurate, uh, given that MEG is still not, not marvelous in um, saying where the signals are coming from. But um, uh, uh, that's getting better. And I mean, you know, if the, if the OPMs are telling you that they, they know it's the hippocampus, then they're getting down to a pretty good spatial resolution. Yeah, that's impressive. Yes. So I, I would myself, if I was starting again, first of all, I would work with animals 
and I would use o OPMs. Hmm. And I would recommend to any scientist starting now that they should also spend some time in an animal lab. They might learn some anatomy and that would do them some good. I would use OPMs and then if I, if I was to give any advice to somebody starting out, and we've covered this, it would be don't define yourself by a method you use. Define yourself by the problems you want to solve and use whatever methods will solve that problem. That's the way other scientists behave. It's a very peculiar fact to me of imaging that psychologists in particular have gone over to it and they now think of themselves as imagers. That's terrible. Yeah, no, I think it was because imaging was so, you know, it's felt like a, such a deep well of, of potential that people are like, okay, I'm going to do imaging now and it will answer this wide swath of potential questions. But I agree. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. So, so uh, in other words, I don't think it's changed the brain in the way that Hubel and Wiesel changed the way we think about the brain, or in the way that Leslie Ungerleider changed the way we think about the brain when she talked about the dorsal and ventral visual system, or Mel Goodale and David Milner, or Larry Weisskrantz when he discovered blind sight, which was an entree into the study of, of awareness and consciousness. Yes. So for me, even though I've said the things that I think imaging can do, for me, it's still a disappointment. And it's not, it's not what I would do. And, and the recommendation to young people is, think of what interests you. What buzz, what bugs you, and and the way I put it is, what what do you think about in the bath? Yeah, that, that bugs you. And what wakes you up at night? What what do you go to sleep trying to solve, and in the morning you've got the answer? Try to find that. That's difficult, but try to find that and then use all the methods that are available to you. That's um, great advice. I mean, it, it's... Uh... And the last thing is to do with neuroanatomy. I mentioned learn some neuroanatomy as people do who work on animals. It really worries me that when I, uh, in, in a recent book I published on understanding prefrontal cortex, I went through the localizations of all the things in the papers I read, and the majority were wrong. That's because the people simply did not know in the way that, say, Mike Petridis does, or I do, the detailed neuroanatomy of the brain. Now, you might say, but look, surely, there's enormous variability in cytoarchitectonic areas. I believe that's false. I believe that's not because there's variability. It's because our normalization techniques are too poor. And if you look, the better the normalization technique, the less the variability in the cytoarchitectonic areas. Yeah. yeah. So it, use the Eulich brain, but you use the standard normalizations, you'll get terrible variability, really good normalization, it's much better. So the reason that it matters that people get their neuroanatomical localizations wrong is this. If I was, as Steve Wise did, uh, recording in premotor cortex, and actually, some of the cells I was recording were in motor cortex. And I tried to publish that paper. It would be rejected. Now, actually, Steve Wise was careful. 
because he looked for uh, uh, the division between motor cortex and premotor cortex as defined by the size of the cell bodies and he oh. made sure that he didn't make that mistake interesting but if you did make that mistake your paper would be rejected now if you publish a paper saying that your activity was in area VIP in parietal and it was actually in LIP since these areas have totally different connection patterns your paper has got the wrong answer and should be rejected yes Just if you've got the statistics wrong exactly I totally agree with that I mean I and the reason it doesn't happen is because most referees don't know the anatomy either and they don't check it yes and they don't look at the tables and they don't look it up themselves in an atlas like the one that mike petridis published recently so they don't check to find out if it's right yeah no i agree with that i think that it would be it's a hard problem it's a lot of work to to do that and if it, it potentially there could be an automated way in some regard, but uh, it's not we're nowhere near that yet. I know brain imaging platforms like like you know um, Brain Voyager or 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 uh, FSL or whatever they have sort of templates, but but it's still a matter of you you have to check you have to make sure. So. Well, there were problems with things like Brain Voyager. If you look at it, you you don't see that there are two superior temporal sulci. You just see one. Yeah. But yes. actually, how it is in the human brain, there is an upper one and then there is a lower one. And and, and you don't see that. So That's... Where is MT? Is it in the upper one or the lower one? Actually, it's in the lower one. So if you say, I'm in the STS, so I'm in MT, you're wrong. Yeah, that's that's actually... Yeah, I think as we get to higher resolution, uh, I think so far people felt that, well, things were low enough resolution that we could wing it. But I agree with you 100% as we get to higher resolution and start making more specific statements about what, what areas are doing, we, we better get, we better make sure. And I don't see, I actually, I, I agree with you. I think it's reviewers need to step up, you know, authors need to step up, maybe the field itself in terms of building standards in, in terms of how you check this. Uh, that needs to be grown, you know, maybe through OHBM or whatever. But I agree with you. I agree. The problems, the, the 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 problems get bigger as you go to higher resolution, unless you get things right. Okay. Well, well, this has been great. I mean, there's so many other questions I could I could ask, and and uh, but at the same time, I I understand, respect your time as well. It, uh, this has been very very useful, and I think that your perspective and your insights and your experience. Uh, are extremely valuable to the field. And I think that, uh, while I, I, and I agree with you almost 100% in everything you said as far as fMRI is concerned, I think fMRI is a great technique, but it's limited. It needs complementary techniques and, and uh, we need to go from there. But I'm not sure if I, yeah. Uh, I, in, in, I mean, you asked me to predict. And I, I'll say not what a prediction, but what I hope. I hope that in 10 years time, people won't be doing it. <laughs> well, I actually have a little bit more hope for things like uh, layer fMRI. I think that... Um... Well, <laughs> all you get from that is three divisions. Yeah. But if you look at Bastos and Miller, they distinguish in monkeys between oscillations in layer one and oscillations in layer six. If you look in Takeda and Miashta in infratemporal cortex, when monkeys are learning paired associates, then you see uh, activation in uh, cell activity in some layers. When they're retrieving it, you see it in others. But that's all within what would be called the middle layers. Yes. In an uh. Yeah, no, I think that, right. I, I agree with you. This just having those three chunks really does limit you. Having a little bit higher resolution, I think we can probably get down to point, you know, two millimeters, um, which might start to uh, uh, resolve that. But I agree. I agree. Um, 
Oh, what's the height of the cortex in the human brain? I what's forget. The, the thickness of the cortex? Um, um, it, it's about two millimeters. Two, two, it, it gets smaller. It's thinner in the visual cortex, but then thicker. Motor cortex is, you know, up to, you know, three or more. So between three and one, I would say. Yeah, it's, it's a big challenge. And, uh, but I also think aside from that, I think that, uh, I think fMRI, I agree with you that it, its role will be more complementary, but I don't see it going anywhere. I don't think you see it disappearing. I think I see it, I would love to have it more clinically useful and that's a whole nother topic, but. Um, yeah, you don't want to be out of a job. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I, you know, I don't care. I mean, myself, I, <laughs> but I. Visits of fMRI. That's what you do. Well, I mean, I can, I, I think that I actually am becoming, I believe, um, I really take to heart your, your point about becoming more of a neuroscientist. I think over the years, you know, I've, I've, uh, I think that, I think it becomes, uh, I think certainly I'm an fMRI methodologist, but yeah, becoming more of a person who embraces just understanding the brain. I find myself moving in that direction. So. Mostly <laughs> Ugalida to take somebody near home. She did anatomy, she did physiology, and she did fMRI. And that was pretty much it. She did some PET, but um, but that was early on. She quickly went to fMRI, but I agree. She did some early on with Jim Haxby, that's right. For me, I'm afraid to understand a system like an engine in a car, you need to intervene, not just measure. You need to intervene. I'm afraid that means that um, for me, to understand the brain is always going to mean uh, working with animal models. Yeah, Whether but I, I totally agree. I think that, but fMRI is the best way of getting in as far as that's concerned. I mean, it's sort of like, you know, seeing it. But, but I, I, anyway, uh, no, I totally agree. I think you're absolutely right. I think you need to intervene. And I think people are realizing that more and more. And using MEG and fMRI, I mean, I definitely think that the, right, fMRI will have a, a much more, more of a complementary role as, as, as opposed to the end in itself. But, um, structural MRI could have another resurgence. And uh... yeah, well, structural MRI, I'm not disputing. Uh, what, once once you can see um, plaques and tangles using structural MRI. <laughs> yeah, I think I think structural MRI has huge potential. I would love to have it see even cell density, neuron density, or conductivity. Yeah that's potentially in the horizon as well. But anyway, yeah, we could keep on going on, but but I'll, how about I'll, I'll, I'll just, uh, yeah, end it there. And, and your advice, I believe is great. And I really appreciate you you spending your time chatting with us. I think it's it's great to have somebody like yourself who just, you know, says it like it is. And, and I think the field needs to hear things like I, that. I apologize for being so abrupt. That's just, that's just my nature, but really, I worry that people used to be taught how to be scientists. You used to keep a hardback notebook and every day you would write down and you weren't allowed to take a sheet out. That was why it was a hardback notebook. And you'd go to a conference and you're writing it and so on. There were all sorts and you kept, I kept the histology for animals all my life in case somebody else wanted to see it. Yes. There were lots of things we were taught that were to do with how to be a scientist that I just don't think are being passed on. Now, having said that, of course, there are going to be just as great scientists in the future as there have been in the past. I know that perfectly well. It's just, as an old man, I am allowed to say that I think we were taught, I, I was taught by Tom Powell, the anatomist, by Alan Cowie. I, I was taught how to do science. I do, uh, I do find, right, I agree. I think I do find that there's this shifting the, the attention away from the science itself to sort of just discussing and, and you know, it's a little bit less grounded in that regard. I I see what you're saying. I'm saying it's a skill. Being a scientist is a skill. You're a problem solver and that's a skill. And you need to learn that skill 
and you need to know what the traps are, how you could be misled. We all go wrong. We all get things wrong. You've got to find out the who are wrong. I completely agree. And it's changing. You're right. And but it's it's tricky because it's a skill, except there's certain people who just do it well. And but there's a whole other group that you that you would benefit from more of a how to do science uh, sort of approach. Like, you know, what you know, it's usually a tra- I think of it as sort of like a a craft. You know, it's like you, if you have people in your lab, they see how you're doing it and yeah. they learn what's important. And so and I do think that that might be changing to some degree. Right. I mean, we don't have physical notebooks anymore. We don't. We don't no, have it's changing. It's pushing for high impact publications and all the rest. And yeah. people to do things fast. And it's pushing for people to cheat. Um, there's a lot of pressure. Right. There's a lot of pressure to you know, get that paper in nature. And uh, I like to think though, that there is also, there are also influences that sort of keep that, uh, it's always a battle though. And I would think that, you know, it'd be sol- it would partially be solved if, you know, being a scientist is, ha- is, is harder than people think. I mean, it's writing grants and handling everything else, teaching and, and you know, it's balancing all this stuff and, and still, and being in a position where you just don't know you're at the edge of knowledge. And so you always feel like you're, you don't know what you're talking about at some level. <laughs> um, it's hard. Anything that anybody finds is out of date in five years, unless you're a Hubel and Wiesel. What any scientist should be thinking of is the people who've worked with them fostering their careers because they are actually the children that are going to take on what you've done. This is obviously a thought that occurs to one when one's old <laughs> and, and near the end of one's life. But so one takes pride in people who, like Matthew Rushworth, uh, of the people who work with me, who, who really do use all the methods, develop new methods like focus deep ultrasound and so on they're the future and i I, i'm the past so you can forget about me well we also didn't even talk about what i think is a is and i'm not saying we should talk about it now but another future aspect is to me it seems that there needs to be uh it seems that there's still there is a growing component of of modeling i mean of actually really trying to build rigorous models um you know to me i've always felt that the data are almost meaningless without you know, at least some construct that predicts. And, and in some sense, it's a hypothesis, but now the models need to grow in, in some sort of sophistication. Okay, let's comment on that. My worry, and I have two, is, and I, I get this from, from David Ma. I was, uh, I was a graduate at the same time as he was. And so in a sense, he was a mentor to me. One thing, David said to me was, you read too much and think too little. <laughs> I've taken that to heart. <laughs> um, the first thing is, you must always, when you put a model forwards, say what other model it's better than. You're always comparing models. Too easy to find a model that will account for X. You have to say why your model does it better than that model. The next thing, and I think this is really important, is that David Marr introduced the idea that you star the predictions that you make. And it wasn't there in the Cerebella paper, but um, he said it in words rather than stars. So the idea was, if a three-star prediction turns out to be wrong, then the whole theory falls. If a one-star prediction turns out to be wrong, then, okay, that's a twig, you can modify things. And two is in the middle. So you're being really honest about which predictions matter. And if you 
let's say uh, the abstract of his cerebellar paper in uh, uh, 1969 you'll see that he says specifically that if x is untrue the whole thing falls whereas if it's untrue he can fiddle with it why are people not doing this they're producing their computational models because they know their maths but they're not comparing with other models to say why their model is better they're not saying my mine makes this prediction yours makes this prediction let's test those two predictions they're not yeah. doing yeah. and saying how important the various components of that model are for the for the existence of that model no i see i, I see what you're saying um and i think it's just an issue of scientific honesty and because david thought incredibly clearly and he was a mathematician a real mathematician this is how he saw things that you, that you must you must do that. I don't see people doing this in the literature. Yeah, I think you're right. I think that uh, the, the the models that are created are not right. I mean, they don't get at fundamental necessarily. I mean, some do. I mean, but but as far as getting at fundamental mechanisms, they're more fitting and they seem to make sense. And and I mean, there's whole continuum models. Uh, and I see what you're saying, though, in terms of you really want to have something that says, well, this is the mechanism all the way down. And if this one experimental result doesn't match what we expect, then the whole thing falls apart because everything is really tightly uh, locked together. Uh, it would be So suppose you've got an attractor model. You've got to say why that's better than some other model. Why does that, what predictions does that attractor model make that some other quite different mathematical model cannot make i totally agree and and one of my things that i that i've sort of have an issue with is for instance the the whole concept of deep neural nets versus uh you know shallow associative nets or whatever it's just like people pick something to, to think about and then they see how far they can push it and then it sort of looks a little bit like what's going on and then they and then it seems like oh that's kind of what could be what's going on and and it doesn't feel like i've learned anything you know, uh, substantial as far as that's concerned. And I, I think that will change like anything. I think that will, once once the models start getting more traction, uh, I think the people will be more careful in terms of how they, what they can test. I think we're in the early days. You know, I think that we're just trying things. Uh, <laughs> but uh, like I said, I won't keep up too much more of your time. And I, I really appreciate you get you coming on. And and uh, this podcast was made at the beginning of the new year. So I wish you the ha a happy new year. And, and, uh, and, and thanks again. Neurosalience is brought to you by the Organization for Human Brain Mapping. This week's episode was produced by Ekaterina Dobrikova and Anastasia Brovkin.